Hi everyone, a little late but happy new year. As we kick off 2024 and think about what we want to accomplish over the next 12 months or so, call it resolutions, goals, or however you like to frame it, don't forget about your smart home. In this video, I'll give you some tips to build and maintain the smart home that you and your family have always wanted, regardless of where you are in your smart home journey. Let me start by asking you the question, why do you have a smart home? Or why do you want a smart home? Perhaps it's for the convenience and saving time, being able to quickly and easily transform the space of your home, maybe it's security, or you just really like cool tech. There's no wrong answer here, but it's a question worth asking. If you're just adding random smart home gadgets that you think look cool, but they don't work properly, or they aren't functional for those in your home, then it's just gonna cost you money, time, and frustration. Ask yourself and members of your household, how's your smart home working for you? Speaking personally, I'm always adding to my smart home. You may think that having a smart home YouTube channel means that I've got this perfect ultimate smart home, but it's totally not true. Yes, I have a lot of smart home accessories, but because I'm constantly trying out new products for video reviews, it means I'm swapping devices, updating scenes and automations, and I'm constantly tweaking. Sometimes that can get really frustrating for my family. A smart home only works when it's set up and maintained properly, and this takes time and work, especially as your smart home grows. Let me give you some tips that I use to maintain my smart home. Do you just wanna add some lights that turn on when you enter a room? That's something you can get started with just a smart switch and a motion sensor. Or maybe you have a plan to make all of the lights in your house smart so you can turn them all on or off with a single click of a button or a Siri command. With something like that, it could take a while depending on the number of lights that you have. You'll need to consider where to use smart bulbs, where to use smart switches, and whether you wanna use Wi-Fi, which I wouldn't recommend if you have a lot of switches in your home, unless you've got the router to support it. If you wanna add smart blinds, which I can tell you is life-changing, then be prepared because that can be expensive as well. And you'll need to decide whether to retrofit or install new blinds, what technology to use, and also what brand to choose from. Sometimes it can help to write down what you want to accomplish and then add it over time. Discount days like Prime Day and Black Friday can be a great time to stock up, and smart home accessories can make great gifts if anyone asks you. Also, watch for promo codes and discount codes from your favorite creators. Often companies will offer discounts to their audience, especially when launching a new product. Currently have ongoing discounts for the Below Low Tripod Stand and Nanoleaf. Do your research though, find different opinions and make the best choice for you. With exceptions, don't settle. For example, if you're adding smart lights to a closet and you have more basic needs, then you can probably go a little bit cheaper as long as it works. But plan to occasionally spend a little bit more when needed for more important areas of your home. It's better to wait a little longer to get the device that you really want, like Lutron Caseta for example, than go with something just because it's cheaper or on sale. Building your smart home slowly will also make it easier to play around and find out what you like before expanding too quickly. I'm someone that loves smart lighting, from bulbs to light strips, lamps, and decorative panels, and I've definitely been guilty of overdoing it at times. I love the chill vibe that you can create with various accent lights, but you also wanna make room for functional and relaxing light. So I'm not saying buy less smart lights, but I do recommend going with lighting that has good quality whites, not just color. If you're buying lights and they only say RGB, then the light's gonna do its best to simulate white, which usually appears to green, yellow, or red. Many smart lights include added chips for warm and cool light, and this will make a big difference, sometimes referred to as white ambiance or tunable white. Also, bonus points for those products that include adaptive lighting, so that you can automatically go from cool white in the day to warm light in the evening and early morning. When it comes to panels, I'm really thinking about nanoleaf shapes and lines, maybe twinkly squares. You wanna make sure they're in a place that looks good even when they're turned off. I love nanoleaf because they can really add a wow factor to your space, but it can look off-putting if it's in the wrong place. This is my personal preference, but I wouldn't prefer shapes in, say, a main living room. I reserve these mostly for my basement rec room where we watch movies or in kids' bedrooms. I'm definitely not saying that they wouldn't look good in a living room, just based on my personal style. With shapes, you can get black or white for versatility, and if you're looking for something a little more elegant, then you can go with Nanoleaf Elements. They don't display colors, but you can adjust the color temperature between warm and cool. If you're watching this video, then you're probably looking to set up your smart home in Apple Home, which means it doesn't need to work with Matter as long as you see that works with Apple Home or HomeKit logo. Don't be fooled into thinking that if it's not Matter, then it'll be worse or obsolete soon. I don't think that's the case. Matter's fine, the reliability is definitely getting much better, and because of Matter, we have a lot more products that work in Apple Home. But that doesn't mean that they're better. For example, some products work in Apple Home and you can update them to Matter via an OTA update. But why? Unless you're looking to use them on multiple ecosystems, there's really no reason for it. 
It's just not as reliable in my experience as Apple Home, and it's missing some key features like adaptive lighting. Instead, pay attention to the technology it uses. If it's Bluetooth, for example, then maybe it's outdated. Wi-Fi is great, just be mindful not to overwhelm your Wi-Fi network. Thread is super popular right now since it's fast and energy efficient, and it doesn't need a manufacturer's hub. Then there's bridge technologies like Zigbee, which I find works really well, and Lutron Caseta, which has their own proprietary ClearConnect technology. Once your devices are set up in Apple Home, then you can create automations, like having lights turn on when you open a door, or having a scene containing multiple devices activate every day at a particular time. And that's great. I mean, really, that's one of the best parts of having a smart home. But sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes you wanna close your blinds before sunset when they're scheduled to close. Or maybe you've had a long day at work and you want dim, warm light instead of that fun, colorful light that you're used to. Of course, you can use the Home app in your iPhone. iPads connected to wall mounts can be really useful. And probably the most common would be a HomePod. Whether it's the full-size HomePod or a HomePod mini, having some throughout the house can really make it easy to control your smart home. If you have a lot of devices, then I recommend creating scenes for your common actions, as I find that the HomePod can be easily confused. Another thing that I really recommend for controlling your devices is buttons and remotes. Sometimes it's just easier. I really like flick buttons because they're so small, I can place them almost anywhere, and I can control three different scenes per button. The Akar Wireless Mini Switch is another great one, though you will need an Akar Hub. If you're using Philips Hue, then the Lutron Aurora is a smart decision. Not only will it give you a physical dimmer switch for your Hue lights, but it also locks your switch into the on position so it can't accidentally be turned off. Perfect for when guests come over because it looks just like a regular dimmer dial. Hue also makes a remote control and many blinds have optional remote controls like Smart Wings and Lutron Serena. So don't overlook physical controls, they can make your life much easier. I just wanna say, stay away from the Wemo Stage Scene Controller. It's a cool concept since you can control so many scenes with a single switch, but it doesn't work well. I also haven't had consistent luck with the Onvis HS2. If it doesn't work, move on. If you have an existing smart home, then right now I want you to think about what's not working and go fix it. Sometimes products just suck. Sorry you wasted your money, I've been there too. But if you have products that are just constantly not responding, or you find yourself having to factory reset often to get them to work, then it's time to move on. I finally replaced my Thread Wemo dimmer after about a year. It never worked, and I was just too busy to change it, so it feels good to finally have a working switch in this room. I've got a Philips Hue GU10 that's been flickering and not calibrated to the correct color temperature. It's time for me to finally replace that as well. I'm willing to bet that you've got some products too that don't work well, and month over month, you're just living with the inconvenience and hoping for that magical firmware update to fix the problem. Having a smart home is supposed to make things easier, so if it's taking more time than it's saving, it's time to move on and either replace it or deal with it not being smart for a while. Similar to the previous topic, if you have devices that are non-responsive, then it's time to fix it. With so many accessories in my smart home, I'm constantly doing this. There's always something that's not behaving properly. If it's a one-off issue or just started, then there's some easy steps that you can try to fix some common issues. Reboot the device. This can mean unplugging the device, waiting about 10 seconds and then plugging it back in. It could also mean removing a battery and reinserting it or flipping a breaker. Sometimes rebooting your Wi-Fi can help as well. Unplug your router, wait a couple of minutes and plug it back in. For Thread devices, you can restart your HomePod and Apple TVs. Some also find that when your primary home hub is hardwired, perhaps an Apple TV connected to ethernet, then that can help with the reliability of your smart home. Now it can be difficult to assign one particular device as a primary home hub, so you have to play around with that. And honestly, I find that advice a little hit and miss, but still something to try. For bridge technologies, then rebooting the manufacturer bridge can sometimes solve the issue. Sometimes it's helpful to go into the third-party app as well and see if your device is working there. Perhaps there's also a firmware update that you can try that may help. Lastly, if it's still not working, then delete the device from Apple Home, do a factory reset, and then re-add it. I hate resetting devices because it's time consuming, and then you need to re-add all your scenes and automations. I tell myself, just do it and you'll be glad that you did. You can also reach out to the manufacturer, especially if it's within the warranty period, and also just doing a Google search to see if it's a known issue, if others are experiencing something similar, then sometimes there's suggestions there that you can try as well. Having good Wi-Fi is important, especially when you have a smart home. You don't need to necessarily spend a lot of money, but you do want strong Wi-Fi, usually a mesh system that will provide full coverage to your home. Even if you don't have a lot of Wi-Fi accessories, your HomePod and Apple TVs will often use Wi-Fi, and that's what communicates with the rest of your smart home accessories. 
Typically, most people will tell you to ditch your internet service provider's modem router combo for something a little bit stronger and more reliable. I say that that is often true, but not always. This doesn't apply to everyone, but where I live, I'm lucky enough to get fiber internet with both Bell and Kojiko, and I've tried both. I'm using Bell's GigaHub that provides speeds up to three gigabits per second down and up, but Bell doesn't allow a bridge mode that passes all your network steering onto your own provided router. I've tried the Eero 6 Pro and one from TP-Link as well, using workarounds like PPPoE pass-through and advanced DMZ to avoid the double NAT issue, and I end up with slow speeds and constant disconnections. I've scoured the web for tips and I've spent way too many hours trying to solve this. This isn't even an Apple home issue at this point. I've got two kids addicted to their devices and it's like the end of the world for them. If only they could understand the pain of being disconnected from the internet when someone picked up the phone to make a phone call. With Kojiko, they do allow bridge mode though it does need to be done by their tech support team but I was having issues with Kojiko as well. While I was getting one gigabit per second download speeds, I was only getting about 30 megabits per second up. There were also just periods where it was lagging, even with ethernet connected devices, so I just ended up switching back. Bell also sells pods for their whole home Wi-Fi for an added monthly cost, of course. I did find that these pods help with a stronger connection to devices further away from my router, like outdoor lighting and cameras, but Apple Home became much less reliable. Lots of no response errors. It's as if the pods were confusing Apple Home when trying to communicate with various devices. When I finally gave up on the pods, my smart home instantly improved. So as weird as it sounds, if you're in a situation like me in Canada, this part of Canada, then choose Bell as long as fiber is an option and settle with the GigaHub and avoid the plume pods if you can. When it comes to the internet, you're at the mercy of what's available in your area. So while this scenario doesn't apply to everyone, I can imagine that there are several areas with similar ISP options. And since Wi-Fi is so important to a solid smart home, I wanted to share my personal experience. I would love to see Bell add bridge mode to their routers, and it would also be great to see Apple make their own routers like they used to that could be optimized to work with Apple Home. Adding smart devices doesn't always make sense. One example for me is my powder room. It's about the only room where I don't have any smart switches. Instead, I'm using a Lutron light switch with a built-in motion sensor and an ambient light sensor. When someone enters the room and it's dark, the light turns on, and when I leave, it turns off a minute later. It's so simple. Everything is programmed right within the device. No HomeKit codes, no scenes to worry about. Adding a smart switch in this particular room would only complicate things. This kind of a switch can also work well in closets, so it's a great way to keep things simple and save a little money as well. Some people may have mixed opinions on this one, but I say mixing and matching is totally fine in most situations. I'm not saying to aim for that, I'm just saying it's okay. There's definitely some benefits to aligning brands though, especially for lighting. If it's main lighting versus accent lighting, I don't think it really matters much, but if you have a fixture with multiple bulbs, then you'll likely get better color consistency if the bulbs are all the same. In my bedroom, I went with all hue lights for my overhead lights, side tables, and floor lamp. Not only does this give me consistent lighting, it means I can trigger hue specific scenes. I can also use my Lutron Aurora. While it's made by Lutron, it's made for Philips Hue. I love these things when using Hue lights. I also have a Hue dimmer switch, and although I can use it with HomeKit scenes, it works best with Hue scenes. The top button cycles through various Hue scenes. I can dim the lights, but the off button I've set up in Apple Home instead, which triggers a scene that turns off not only my Hue lights, but also my Eve light strip and my closet light that's connected to an Eve light switch. In other areas like my basement, I have a lot of Nanoleaf lights, which is nice so I can sync all of my devices together. But I also have some Hue lights and Gobi lights, and it's totally fine. It's totally up to you, but I don't think you need to pick a brand and only use that one company. Just find what you like and go for it. I hope you have a great start to 2024 and you find these tips useful as you build out your smart home goals. My goal with this channel is to help you create the smart home that you've always wanted, no matter how small or how grand. Smart home accessories shouldn't just be tech that looks cool or sounds cool, it needs to work for you and ultimately enhance your life. So it's time to let your smart home work for you and not the other way around. That's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching and I'll talk to you soon.